um, here to talk through things with her tonight is the wonderful Shanti Sakharin. Um, Shanti, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, a novelist and television writer based in Berkeley, her latest novel, Lucky Boy, was an NPR Best Book of 2017 and an Indie Next Great Read. Her middle grade novel, The Samosa Rebellion, is due out in fall 2021. Very excited for that. Uh, she recently left academia to join the writer's room for NBC's New Amsterdam. Congratulations, Shanti, and thank you. Thanks again for being here. Yeah. Um, uh, Korachista Kakpour's debut novel, uh, Sons and Other Flammable Objects, was the New York Times editor's choice, one of the Chicago Tribune's Falls Best, and the 2007 California Book Award winner in the first fiction category. Her second novel, The Last Illusion, was a 2014 Best Book of the Year, according to NPR, Kirkus Reviews, BuzzFeed, Pop Matters, Electric Literature, pretty much everybody. Uh, among her many fellowships is the National Endowment for the Arts Award. Her nonfiction has appeared in many sections of the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Elle, Slate, Salon, and Book Forum, among many others. She's been guest faculty at BCFA and Stone Coast MFA programs, as well as contributing editor at Evergreen Review. Uh, born in Tehran and raised in the Los Angeles area, Kapoor currently lives in New York City. Um, all of the authors, both authors' books are available from Booksmith. Uh, I'll drop the links in the comments where I hope you'll add any questions that you might have. We will do a Q&A at the end of the program. So I think that's it for me. Um, Porchista, Shanti, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Evan, and thank you, Booksmith. Booksmith was such a fun stop for me last time with Sick. Um, it was one of the stops that I wasn't too sick to do because ironically, like last book, um, book tour, or two years ago, I was too ill to do most of my book tour. And now that I'm better, um, you know, I'm doing Zoom readings, which is strange. But I have to say, like, we were just talking beforehand, it, there is something kind of nice for writers to just be like in their homes and like with my dog behind me and <laughs> doing it this way. I'm just kind of sad we don't get to interact. So I, I really like seeing people. And so, yeah, if you can, if you want to ask questions and stuff, I love questions. So think about those. Um, and you can ask anything. And I'm just so honored that Shanti was willing to do this with me too, because I, we just realized I've known her for nearly 20 years, <laughs> which <laughs> ages us a bit. Um, but yeah, we met in 2002 uh, when we were both at Johns Hopkins. And we were roommates, which is kind of amazing, um, in this little apartment in Baltimore. And we, well, we'll share, we'll share some of that stuff with you guys. It's pretty amazing. Um, okay, all right. Let me just go ahead. I, I've sort of promised, this is Brown Album. I've sort of promised that I'll, I've been um, reading like different essays from this collection, each reading. So I'm gonna continue that. Um, and this time I'm gonna read probably from the essay that's like now the most well-known in this collection. It's the one that's like being anthologized like almost too much, but I'm, I'm grateful for that, but it's just like everywhere. But I haven't read from it a lot because it's actually one of the more recent essays and it's called How to Write Iranian America. And it ran in Catapult in uh, 2017. And it was an essay that I actually spent, it's a very long essay, I won't read the whole thing, but it's an essay that I spent about 10 years writing. And it was an essay that I, I wrote, I kept this computer file that I would just add to all the time when I was writing the other essays that you see here in Brown Album. And a lot of those essays basically really pigeonholed me, but they were also like dreams for me because like the New York Times was asking me to write about Iranian American experience. And I was like, wow, the New York Times. But at the same time I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm writing the same essay over and over again, and I just feel like I'm becoming a spokesman in a way that I should not be, and it was just very, I had all these conflicted feelings, but, so I put them all into this essay at the end of this collection, and, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and read, like, the first several parts, um, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation, and then we'll do Q&A. Okay, How to Write Iran in America, and it has an epigraph um, by Audre Lorde, and the epigraph is, because the machine will try to grind you into dust anyway, whether or not we speak. One, begin by writing about anything else. Go to the public library in your Los Angeles suburb and ask for all the great books people in New York City read, please. Wonder if the reference librarian knows a living writer and ask her 
What would a living writer read? And an American one, please. When she realizes you are in your single digits and asks, where are your parents, young lady? Don't answer and demand Shakespeare and take that big book home and cry because you can't understand it. Tomorrow, go back to reading the dictionary a letter at a time and cry because you can't learn the words. Ask your father if you will cry daily for the rest of your life and remember his answer decades later. When you are older, you will care less about these things. Pray to God you still believe in that you will once more avoid ESL with all its teachers who look to you with the shine of love, the stench of pity, refugee, resident alien, political asylum seeker, immigrant, foreigner, the words you know that you don't want to know. Write because it's something to do, something your parents will let you do because it looks like homework. Write because one place to live in is your head and it's not broken yet. Write because it's something to drown out the sound of your parents fighting deep into the night. When the second grade teacher, the teacher your father calls an alcoholic, tells you that you will be an author one day and suggests you look at the market guide for young writers, step right up and call yourself a young writer. Decide to really write and write about anything but Iran in America. Ghosts, Victorian girls, maybe even ones with tough names, Easter bunnies that are homicidal, you might have ripped off the unicula, candy, white girls, more white girls. Even then you understood sales. Worry about the fact that your family won't be able to afford a computer and worry about how your fingers get stuck in between the keys of a yellow typewriter your father bought back from Iran and learn that the only way for your brain not to spiral and worry is to write. Worry about how you, young writer, will ever get to New York City until you do. Get a scholarship to a fancy college with writers and writing workshops, a thing you've never heard of full of other students told they'd be an author one day. Ignore the dorm politics and the sweet mates who tell you their dads paid for you to be there and write, write. Los Angeles, the devil, literary theory, art, the East Village, white men, and more white men. Become known as a writer there, and a writer who doesn't write about identity. No identity for you, you tell yourself, you tell them. Wear black and big glasses and smoke cigarettes because you are a New York young writer, and that can be anyone. When your favorite professor, senior year, fails, fails your paper on modernism that you've worked on for weeks, when she tells you that she can tell English is your second language, when she tells you that maybe writing is not for you, that maybe you need to go into a field like those new Iranian studies fields. You keep imagining those fields like the villages of your homeland they label third world. And go to your dorm and expect to cry, but don't. Chain smoke a pack of cigarettes and never forget her words and commit yourself to writing more, writing more about anything else. Years later, attend another prestigious college for graduate school and spend long hours with a famous writer as your professor and advisor who tells you to forget that other professor, that you are a writer, that you can do this. Hold on to her words and almost miss it when she says, but why don't you write about what you know? Thank her as you always do and hope she doesn't see your tears. Keep turning in stories about anything else. Math, chaos theory, rape, the time you were raped but in the sci-fi premise, the time you're raped in the fantasy premise. The time you're raped is something they call metafiction. Dogs, suicidal people, suicidal people with dogs, 9-11. Although writing about it makes you worry you are getting close to yourself, too close to what you know, which gets a little too close to writing what you know, but keep reminding them that it was because you were a New Yorker, not because you were a Middle Easterner, that you felt the trauma. Keep reminding them that the hijackers were not Iranian. When they tell you they don't know what you are anyway, don't say a word, just keep working harder and tell yourself you will get the fellowship for another year. Get the fellowship and avoid all their eyes. When your advisor suggests you work on a novel, that you are after all a novelist, hear novel like a curse, arranged marriage and a death sentence, all that unknown potential for devotion to writing anything else. Two, suddenly you can't write about anything else. Sit in your first apartment without a roommate and realize you have nothing else to write about for the span of a novel. Hate yourself and it, and then go ahead and write it. You're Iranian America because no one else will see it. This is your first real novel, so what do you know? You are a, fe a fellow at a famous university in Baltimore that doesn't pay you enough to teach, so you add on being a hostess at a bistro where, you're, where the parents of your students go, sometimes with tenured professors of your department who pretend they don't see you as they kiss and hug the owner who sexually harasses you every day. 
Why would a word you write matter? Quit smoking, start smoking, quit again, start again. And watch it come out more and more in every draft, anger with your parents, frustration with your blood, anxieties surrounding the somehow still new land, all that is Iranian America. Let your truth come out hard and fast and untranslatable because no one else will see it anyway. Three, they see it. Four years later, it is your first novel and it is published and you are Miss Literary Iranian America, friend jokes. First Iranian American novelist, a journalist mistakenly writes, while another calls your debut novel the first work that is entirely Iranian American, all diaspora, which gets closer to the truth but not close enough. Who could even tell you who they ignored before you? When they ask you to represent the Iranian diaspora in Los Angeles, start by explaining you grew up a half hour and many realities away from Tehranjelis, that you were raised in a tiny apartment in the low income district of a small suburb with no other Iranians nearby. When they ask you to do it anyway, go through with it. Regret quitting smoking. Try to speak of other things. But what about Iranian Americans, they always go. And a friend who is tired of your size tells you, look, you did that to yourself. It's all in your novel. Say fair enough and start smoking again. Around Persian New Year, months after your first novel comes out, start to run out of money again. Old problem, but maybe with a new solution now, you think. Ask friends if they know someone at the venerable paper where they gave you a good review of your debut novel. Pitch a piece on Iranians celebrating Persian New Year. Your angle, being Iranian in a bad time to be Iranian. Think to yourself, when was there ever a good time to be Iranian here? And pitch it anyway. Hear nothing back and tell yourself you and your Iranian America are not worthy of that newspaper. Be more shocked than gracious a few months later when out of nowhere an editor at another section of that very paper writes you and mentions he's a fan of your work and would you like to contribute an essay to this author series on summer? You can't believe it. This editor has acknowledged your novel and yet is not asking you to write a particular thing about Iran in America. But when you sit down to write, surprise yourself. What you write is about your mother and you, so it's Iran in America. Feel slightly defeated. Writing which I, what I know was never my thing, you know you used to whisper but a part of you anticipates they will want this, and they do. Behold the awe of everyone around you. Behold your own awe. You are in your dream paper, an essayist. Editors who never heard of you or your novel start asking for your essays about Iran in America. Soon you are back in the same paper with another essay of, of all things, Barbie's 50th anniversary, and somehow you also make that about Iran in America. You learn to interview your parents and dig up whatever they will give you from their past and add that to messy memories of your childhood and glue it all together. Be amazed at how your formula works sometimes and helps you work out some things. Be amazed at how it sometimes seems to help others. Remind yourself that this can't last. Iranian Americans from all over the country write you and thank you and you tell everyone this was a nice turn. You did your part and now you will go back to what you were meant to write anything else or except you don't you keep writing it and i'll stop there and it just it keeps going and it keeps spiraling and you know <laughs> and here we are and it's just it's a very weird essay to read because like even when i talk about barbie's 50th anniversary and i'm kind of like poking fun at that essay that i wrote that was in the new york times that's one of the earlier essays in this collection so it, it's kind of like a, a mischievous essay for me because i'm kind of like like this essay is kind of saying fuck you to the other essays in the collection, <laughs> but not entirely, but kind of. So that was fun. Anyways, thank you. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Porchista. For everyone who's joining us um, post intros, my name is Shanti, Shanti Sagarin. I'm a novelist and I've known Porchista for what, almost 20 years now, really? Yeah, it's crazy to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So full disclosure, we shared an apartment in Baltimore in grad school. I have so, I just literally only want to talk about that because our apartment was kind of amazing. I mean, it was your apartment first. And, and I should say, Shanti had, the, had a fellowship at that university that I got the next year. So she was technically like in the year above me. And so I got there and like you had an extra space in this really cute apartment. And, um, and you were like, I guess I was just this like kind of messy New York girl who's 
I was just like basically kind of like a 9-11 refugee. The only reason I even applied to grad school was because I like needed to leave 9-11 era in New York. I was so traumatized. And then I came and I like visited and you were so like nice and classy and gorgeous and amazing. And I was like, okay, this is great. I'll live with her. And then I also like, you made me also think like, oh, there must be tons of people of color here, which is great. But I think we probably made up like 70% of the people of color in the program, which was crazy. I mean, there was literally like, I feel like three every year, maybe like the year after me was Chimamanda Adichie and like one other person. It was so yeah. nice. Yeah, there's then, a from every continent. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think we had like Val in my ear. There's one other person. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then it was so nice. And then we had like parties and like, like you, rem I, you mentioned on Twitter, we had a party where we had like a cigarette tray put out, which was so mm -hmm. amazing of us, like people oh, in our 20s. Yeah. Cause we didn't have money and our apartment was only like, we each paid like $300. Yeah. Yeah. It was not Fancy. I mean, I just, I could just talk about that rent amount for the next hour. Like, I know. <laughs> that's all I wanted to talk about, just our rent. Um, and we had so much drama. Oh my God, there's so much like... We had a rat. People I was dating. Oh yeah, we had a rat. But I'm of course thinking about my dating life, which was a nightmare. <laughs> and like, horrible. Like, I was like dating all the fucked up people. And our apartment was so crazy and like wonderful too. And... I don't know. That was like a really, like, if you weren't there, I really would have cracked. I think I would have left, actually, because yeah. you seemed so much more stable than I did. And I knew you'd be published. I was sure of that. Because you were like the only person that was in best, what was that called? Best American Voices? Uh, best New American Voices. Yeah. yeah. That was like a thing every grad student of that era, I mean, still, I think every grad student or any just young writer wants to be in that. And, and like, you were the only person that got in there and we were all like, holy shit, like. Yeah, and I didn't know what I was doing, but that's another, that's, that's a topic. I still remember that amazing story you had. Mm -hmm. And so you just seemed like, and then you also like, you know, had like a stable partner, who you're, you know, is your part, you know, it was just amazing. You had, you were like very grown up and I was like incredibly mature and like constantly freaking out, I think. I was like constantly. all kind of freaking out, but you know. It was so bad. Anyway, that's cool, folks. That's... Did you know I was secretly smoking in my room all the time? I think I told you finally. But for a while, I was, like, so scared you'd take me out because I, like, didn't want to fart with you. But I, I don't think I thought it was supposed to be a secret. Oh, I, like, thought I was hiding it because I was, like, this is so gross what I'm doing because the space was so nice and and I would just, like, chain smoke in my room miserably and, like, God, it was actually a miserable place in so many ways, but also I miss it a lot. And I'm still friends with so many. I mean, you know, there's I, you guys are still in my life, weirdly. Oh, I, although yeah. our class was very adversarial, our, our group of fiction writers, we all had a lot of like drama. Mm -hmm. Do you, you think know? that formed you in some way? Like the, it was a very contentious group of writers like coming up together. And I always tell my students, you know, be each other's support network, but your class did not do that. Do you think that? You were the bad apple year, and, and I think it did actually help me because I had such a supportive experience with Sarah Lawrence with my undergraduate, and I was like kind of like the star fiction writer in my year, and it was like very, like it was good. In high school, I'd been the editor of my newspaper, and like I had all this confidence about writing, and I get to Johns Hopkins, and it was like, oh, your confidence? Fuck that. You're not only going to, you're not the best writer, by the way, and you're also going to be totally humiliated every time there's a workshop by these guys, these like white boys who went to Ivy League schools. Cause like everyone in my year was all Ivy League. It was really weird. And, and these white boys are gonna like humiliate you constantly and then like get, like try to get you drunk and sleep with you. It's like such a mess. And so I was just like really like up against something. So I felt like I had to be really great. And then, but then also I had these deep bonds with my teachers like Alice McDermott, who we both had and Stephen Dixon, who we both had. and. Stephen Dixon, who sadly just passed away, I just spoke at his memorial, and it was so gutting, and I still remember, like, like, this one spring day where, when I was with Callie and Susan, I tried to kill myself in this park, it was such a fucking crazy day, but it was, like, kind of normal for me around that time period, I was, like, constantly taking weird medications, and I was so miserable at Hopkins, and, and so then I went, I had, like, a conference with Stephen Dixon, I went to see him, he was, like, my dream writer, he was a big reason for why I even applied to Hopkins, and he, I just remember like crying in his room and he like tore this orange with his like hands. He just tore it in half and gave me one half and, and I didn't even know how to eat it. And he just like 
buried his face in the orange. And then I did that too. And I was crying into this orange. And then he was like, well, you know, I really think you're a novelist. And I think you're actually a really good writer. And I think you can really do this. I and mean, he just didn't say that stuff to everyone. And so that was like really moving for me. And Alice McDermott really believed in me too. So I just, I suddenly felt like the teachers I really cared about believed in me and I had to believe in me. But I, I, I was finally aware of this like anti-audience I'd have, which would be like, like these like angry young white men who were going to make a lot of like what later became like the or Brooklyn writing scene, you know, and that they would be my competition and that they would actually do anything to cut me down. And that I had to be like, really like, like strong. And that also like, it also really cemented for me that like writers of color, like we have to like, we are all we have kind of, because some of these right white writers will really like, I mean, they're not even aware of their racism, but like there was, there was never an openly racist thing in Hopkins, but there was just like that feeling of it. You know what I mean? Where you just yeah. can sense it. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a real sense of like who belonged, you know, who the stars could be. Um, yes. Who was the dark horse. Yes. And um, I think what you and I and a few other people did was just put our heads down and write, right? Yeah. We just wrote. Yeah. We yeah. just did our work, really. It was like the only thing that was saving me then was just to yeah. read and write and just to do the stuff I like to do because like all these boys were talking about like literary theory in class and I really had like was self-taught in so many ways. Like I only read theory like on my own, like here and there. I didn't know the language that they spoke. So I was just like, you know, I can't be what they want. So I'm just going to do what makes me happy and go back to like why I wanted to be a writer in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was an interesting place. I do miss Baltimore. I do feel like we were really lucky to live in Baltimore because I keep like making excuses to go back there. And I, I really love that city. Yeah. I mean, how weird to be in such a white place in a city that's not very white at all. Right. You know, so that was like interesting. And like, I, I really, Baltimore, I think was a wonderful. It was a great city for writing as well. What? It was a great city for writing as well. Yeah. There's no like feeling to it. Yeah, yeah, it was a great place for artists and just so much going on and like, it was like kind of a crazy place. Like, I remember you and I, I, I wondered if you remember this, I thought this in the shower. Do you remember there would be a guy every once in a while who'd ring our doorbell, who'd pretend to be like the, um, the phone company and we would look down because you, yeah, this happened several times. I think one time you weren't there, but I think one time you were there wow. and I was like, Shanti, this thing is, keeps happening with this dude. He was just some like crazy, like drug dealer in the neighborhood and he would ring the doorbell, pretend he was like Con Ed and this is how he burglarized people. But I was like a savvy New York girl. So I'd like look down, I'd just see this bro with his friends downstairs and I'd be like, this right. is not like Con Ed or whatever the phone call. you were there. I would have like made them tea. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, "Fuck no, you're not coming in." And yeah. like, you know, it was like, it was like a whole thing. And then we lived in the Baltimore, like, what is it, Beltway Sniper was parked just a few blocks from us during his his main, like, sniper moment. Yeah, this is nuts. It was on Calvert Street, right by us. So it was kind of a crazy time to be there, but um, I do miss it. Baltimore is like the only other city other than New York that I would move to. I think mm -hmm. in America, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, to transition somewhat, yeah. so I remember, and this is a real transition, um, you would like burst into our apartment like on a daily basis with like some new idea or some new obsession or some new thing that was fascinating you about the world. And I see this in a lot of my journal journalist friends, like you're constantly in dialogue with the world, you're constantly looking at the world for ideas. And so just, you know, I'm wondering what is your fascination these days? What are you learning about? What are you loving? Oh, I love that question. I mean, it is true. I remember we had dial-up internet and it would really frustrate me because like I had to be like, like a, I was always a news junkie and I've continued to be, especially after 9-11, I really became a big one. Mm -hmm. um, well, like these days, I'm really tired of reading about the pandemic stuff, which I was really obsessed with for a while, of course. But now that I'm like in the heart of the pandemic in Queens, I just can't even cope with it. But um, I am really obsessed with reading about Hong Kong right now. Um, partially because I was thinking about like living in Hong Kong because I have a lot of friends who are, are from there or live there right now. And so just this like horrific thing that's happening, like Hong Kong as we know it being over right now and, and the horrific 
you know, horrific um, Chinese government and what Beijing and, and that, that whole like thing is really obsessing me and just reading about these activists in Hong Kong. Like, I'm kind of shocked that more Americans are like for, for a country that pretends to be obsessed with freedom. Like, why aren't we obsessed with what's happening in Hong Kong? I mean, not that that could, I mean, like, actually that could happen in America. What am I saying? But like, it should just interest you anyways. I mean, Hong Kong is a really, really important place. And so um, I, I was lucky enough to just have like one evening there and I just before this all happened I was writing an essay for Condé Nast Traveler about um, about my fascination with Hong Kong and like Hong Kong cinema and the evening I had there en route to a book festival in Indonesia and so that's been really really obsessing me in a big way there is always something that I'm obsessed with it's true mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. recently I'm also weirdly this is really weird this will surprise you Basketball. I've been really fixated on basketball. A um, little bit was about the M Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman stuff kind of got me interested again, but I've always kind of wanted to like be a basketball player. My aunt was kind of like a champion basketball player in Iran. And, um, and, and I just like, it's like one of the only sports that I find kind of interesting to watch, but I realized I never really knew the, how the, like the technicalities of the game, you know, I've never been to a basketball game, but now I want to go to one. And now I'm like studying games. So I'm like looking at all these like sports blogs and stuff and trying to like study basketball games so I can like really learn like how to play it. Cause one of my goals this summer, ironically, was that I was gonna join like a community basketball team, <laughs> like a girls basketball crew. I don't know, I just thought it would be fun. And I'd been yeah. so chronically ill the last few years and I'm just like unable to do anything physically. like. Right. I just thought that would be fun, and I don't know, I just like basketball aesthetic, like, you know, the music I listen to, and things I'm into, it's like, sort of overlaps with basketball culture, so, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, that, those are the main things, I think, um, and then I'm baking a lot, so I'm reading a lot of, like, cooking blogs, but I have to say, I don't like the cooking blog culture, or, like, it's just, like, really annoying, and, like, I feel like all those women are, like, weird Republicans who are racist. Well, as usual, I think everyone's racist. That's always right. been, always has right. been. <laughs> so I don't like the the vibes of some of the cooking blogs. But I, I mean, I just today I baked this matcha olive oil cake. And Amazing. Yeah. Um. Cool. I always see. I knew there would be like these disparate, <laughs> like just random things that you were you were into. Now there always is. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> So just to give oh, K pop your... too. K pop, sorry, K -pop, Shanti. Right. Yeah. BTS. I'm with K pop. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like I, well now it's all K pop. I've I've really branched out to like I'm just obsessed. Mm -hmm. I can't stop. So cool. It's a big problem for me right now, actually. <laughs> Not a K pop is never a problem. I just um, consume a lot of it daily. Yeah. Which is unbelievable. Yeah. I'm going through a teenage phase in my 40s somehow. I don't know how to explain it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of your teenage phase or earlier phases, I'm just going to give some face time to your book. Thank so, you. So, Brown Album. Um, one, one of the things that surprised me about this is that, you know, it's the title itself is a nod, of course, to the Beatles' White Album and Jay-Z's Black Album. But it's also literally about a brown album, a brown photo album in your family's house. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in the function of visual imagery, both for an immigrant, um, for maybe a refugee, and also just in the, in the moment that we're in now. I mean, f photographs, visual imagery is more important than it's ever been. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Um, for you personally, what, what visual representation is, has meant? Yeah, great question too. Um, well, I figured like every time I'd go back to Los Angeles, to my parents' house, I would spend, like I would have a ritual every time I'd go back for like the first day I was there, I would just like not sleep at night. I would be like a kid again, I'd stay up all night. And I would always do the same thing. I would go through this stack of brown albums that they always had. They were just these like cheap fake leather, like old albums. And this one part of my, like my bedroom basically, um, which has become a storage space. And I would just like 
go over them over and over. And it's like, these albums have not changed. They're the same thing that my mom assembled in like the nineties. But I would just have to like ritually like go over every single photo that I've now seen like thousands of times. And it's like, there's nothing that's changed. There's no new photos, there's nothing. And these are all photos from like when we first came to America all the way through my high school years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know why I'm so stuck on like, it's almost like they were comforting, but they were also painful. And I just think for us, like for me at least, as a writer who now writes so much about my life, um, I have to constantly go through those images to remind myself that like we existed, I existed, this is who we were. And because I've had all these like dramatic changes in my life and even dramatic changes in my subject matters and there's been so much turbulence it's always felt in my life, there's something grounding about going through that period of time where it was like we got to America and then I was in high school and that period was like the most, like the longest I've lived in one place and you know it was like post-refugee period and we're just immigrants now we live in this like kind of crappy apartment district in the wrong side of town and then and that like period is just really precious to me it's like where all my material comes from and i just sometimes like i, I just notice i like go over and over our expressions in them i'm trying to read my parents faces because now I'm, I'm you know closer to age to my parents and like I'm trying to really look at myself and who was I, what was I doing? Because so much of the intention, like I set so much intention in those years. I said, I'm going to be a writer one day who lives in New York City. I'm going to have a dog. I'm not going to be married. Like All these weird things <laughs> turned out to be true. Like I'm going to write for the New York Times. There's journals of mine from elementary school where I say, I'm going to write for the New York Times. It was so specific. And you know, my first novel will come out before I'm 30. It literally came out a few months before I turned 30. I mean, it was just like such a weird period where I was so lost in America, but like I set so much of that intention. So I almost have this like mystical obsession with those albums and going through them and like really trying to like tap into who we were and what happened then because, you know, no other period of my life, like not even 9-11 era in New York or, you know, even if this era, I don't think will be like that for me. Um, has been as precious for me as, as that sort of like um, those years, not just in my own personal like adolescence, but because they were also politically important years. You know, I'm basically as old as the Iranian revolution. So those were the years that like Iranians migrated to the US en masse. And um, a lot of like what became Iranian American culture was really shaped in that era. So my own personal history happens to like um, also coincide with the history of Iranian Americans in this kind of like very neat way. So it's also me trying to figure out like um, so much about my own hyphenated identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I like that idea of it being grounding. Yeah. And also almost, almost a mystery that you feel like you can solve. Like you're looking for clues for who you were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really a big thing for me. Yeah. So this idea of exile, um, you talked about Los Angeles a bit just now. Uh, exile is so tied in with place, the place that you can no longer be, the place where you are now. Um, and this collection takes us through many places, right? So we're in Los Angeles, we're in, or Pasadena, where you spent most of your childhood. And we're in Tirangelis, which is a very special corner of Los Angeles. And um, where else? We go through the Deep South, we go to Indonesia, yeah. and of course, New York City, and New York City around 9-11, which is a very particular time in the city's life. Um, and the part that I was maybe most struck by was, was when you spoke about Iran, which is, I'm guessing, a place you don't remember in great detail, right? Because you yeah. left when you were three, is that right? Like three and a half, yeah, yeah. Three and a half. Half. Okay, yeah. but I just want to read a line from one of your essays. Um, this is a Muslim America, a Muslim American in Indonesia. So this is a line from when you're on an airplane flying through Iranian airspace. Outside the window, it was just before dusk, and all you could see was the hazy brown of mountain upon mountain. For a second, I felt like my longing could fill the plane. And that was a really moving line. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, 
you know, what is Iran to you now as someone who has not lived there for most of your life? Yeah, I mean, that moment you're talking about is a really important moment for me in that book, because I think not a lot of people can relate to that feeling of like, not being able to go to the place you were born and, and, and the place you're from. Like, you know, I'm like fully from Iran. Both my parents are from there. That's where I was born. That was where I was meant to live. I was, it was never part of the plan to be here. here. And so just like the only times I've, I've been able to be in contact with Iran since I was like three and a half is like during these flights to Australia, basically, where we flew over Iranian airspace. And I literally wanted to like deck the people sitting next to me so I could like get a good view of Iran because you just saw the mountains that are always in Persian lore and all that. So it's kind of really moving. So for me, it's like, in some ways, I'm like stuck in the same position as a lot of Americans, where it's like, I just take in the news and Iran is always in the news. Like even in January, we all thought we'd be going to war with Iran. So it's like, Iran is always so political. And it's like, I'm always like dealing with that part of Iran. But then there's the whole personal part of Iran, where it's like, I have my dad who went to Iran like over a decade ago, or I have relatives that go back and forth to Iran. So I'm always getting things from Iran, like here's some saffron from Iran, here's a, um, a piece of jewelry from Iran, or here's a, like a letter from someone who lives in Iran, or I'm in touch with bloggers in Iran often, or people on Facebook and things like that. And so, um, so it's like, to me, like someone asked me recently about like Iranian American, like that, that like hyphenated identity. And they were like, oh, well, do you mind being called Iranian American? I said, no, I don't, I think it's accurate. And, and they said, well, yeah, probably you're annoyed at being like Iranian American because you're just American, right? And I was like, actually, I feel differently about that now. Like there was a time period where I really wanted to be seen as American because I became an American citizen, um, like literally just before you saw me at Hopkins, it was like in 2001. And but but the thing is, I really feel more Iranian than American. And that's a really hard thing to even explain to my good friends that grew up around me because I, they hear me and I sound like a valley girl or like a New Yorker at best, you know? But like, I think in Farsi and like, I grew up only around Persian food and like celebrating Persian New Year and all the celebrations that were like very Iranian. And like my household is very traditional. And, you know, my dad is still not an American citizen. and we were just very Iranian. And I, for me, like, it's much more important to be Iranian than American. And I'm like ready to like shed being American, to be honest. I, I can't, I can't like, like stand up for this country anymore. So I really feel more and more every day I become more and more Iranian. And if the situation was different in Iran, I would probably move back to Iran. I mean, I speak Farsi fluently. I don't read and write as well as I like, but I do read and write. Um, you know, why would I not want to go back to where I'm from? I mean, those are my people. When I see Iranians, even when I like kind of roll my eyes at these like tarantulous rich people or whatever, I'm still like, they're my people. Like, I don't fucking care. Like, okay, you're gonna make fun of Shahs of Sunset. Go ahead, make fun of Shahs of Sunset. But you know what? At the end of the day, if I had to like, you know, save some people from a fire, I'd probably save the people from Shahs of Sunset <laughs> because they're my blood. Like, I, there's something that's happened to me as I got, um, as I'm getting older that it was like my dad, it happened to him when I was, when he was my age. And it's like, I'm becoming really like into like your blood and what that means. And so I'm just like, for me, it's like, you can't say anything bad about Iran around me. Like you can't, it doesn't, I don't tolerate that. So I just am very in touch with that being like, where I'm from and, and those are my people and that's what I care about. So yeah, it's just, it's very emotional for me as I get older, it seems. Mm -hmm. More and more. So it's almost taken a biological presence like in your body, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Like a yeah. very deep longing, like I, there's nowhere I would rather be. And I'm just annoyed that that, that country, like, you know, politically their own situation is not better. I mean, a part of me is like, I don't have a family, I should still go back to Iran. Like who cares but it just seems reckless on, on so many levels but you know mm -hmm. I want to really badly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and just to give people a scope a sense of the scope place-wise with this book let's talk a little bit about your time in the deep south in Mississippi yeah yeah so this was in was this in college this was in college this is my senior year of yeah Sarah Lawrence my college mm -hmm. end of college yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to, to brief people who haven't read the book, you were there um, kind of researching and meeting with people at the Faulkner Institute, right? Do you, can you yeah. just like very quickly describe that? 
Yeah, so basically, it was a really bizarre situation. Basically, in my senior year at Sarah Lawrence, I was not like a well-traveled person. I'd only been to like LA and New York. Like that was like, I was going to college in Sarah Lawrence in New York, but then my home was LA. That was like all I'd seen of America. And, and then like, I was doing a lot of drugs at Sarah Lawrence. I was like a very troubled student. Like definitely like, I was kind of fucked up in a lot of ways. And so I had a teacher who was also a Southern Studies professor there. And she was like doing an American studies kind of like, um, uh, what do you call those? Independent studies with me. And, and she said like, she was trying to get me to get interested in school again. Cause I was like in my senior year and I was like on the border of almost dropping out. I was so fucked up. And she was like, well, what, like, what do you love? And I was like, literature, you know, like, and she's like, well, what were some of your favorite writers? And I remember that Faulkner was really my favorite writer. And when I was in high school, I basically read almost everything he'd ever written. And, you know, that was like my first literary love. And, and she was like, well, why don't you write something about Faulkner? And I was like, I don't want to just write a paper about Faulkner. And, you know, I was kind of lazy. I didn't want to write a paper. And so, but then I had this, I had been saving up all this money from like my, like, I don't remember for what, for like graduation or some weird thing. I was working on like shit jobs. And then I just thought, well, what if, I was really into journalism at that time too. And I thought I'd be a journalist. That was my main goal. And I thought, well, what if, wouldn't it be crazy? Because all my friends were trying to go on spring break to like Daytona, but like ironically, and I was like, this is stupid. I, I don't want to do that. But then I thought, what if I just went to like the deep South and like did like a Faulkner project and went to the old Faulkner estate in Oxford, Mississippi. Like suddenly I had that idea and it just seems so crazy. And then the next thing you know, I'm like contacting Southern Studies students when there was like barely even proper email, like it was really wonky email on my college. And, and then suddenly I was setting it up and I was suddenly buying a plane ticket to Memphis. And like from Memphis, I'd have to take a bus to Oxford, Mississippi. And I never traveled around the country at all. So I didn't know what I was doing, but I just was like, why not? And we had the two week spring break. So I was like committing to two weeks in Mississippi. It was nuts. And, and so then the head of the Faulkner, um, of Roanoke, the old Faulkner estate, said he'd meet with me and he'd like help me. It just seemed like some kid who wanted to do a school project. So as I got there and I met the Southern Studies kids who were cool and whatever, and they were really excited to meet like a New York person or whatever. It was very weird. And, um, and I was like very aware of like feeling weird there. Like I did not know anything about the South. And, and like long story long, basically I ended up meeting Faulkner's nephew. And like, he took this really weird liking to me and he'd pick me up at the crack of dawn every day and take me all around the deep South, like Tallah banks of the Tallahatchie River and all this like weird parts of the South and like take me to juke joints where I broke my vegetarianism finally. And like, I don't know, it was magical. I suddenly was like very deep into the world of like Faulkner South. And like, he and I wrote for years to each other after that. It was very poignant. And so I was sort of like in the Faulkner <laughs> circle there. And actually one of the, one of the events I'm going to do with KSA Lemon is like, we're going to do a talk at Square Books. And I was really excited to go back to Square Books in Oxford to like read that essay there. So now I'll do it virtually. But anyways, I've gone back to Oxford, Mississippi several times since. And it was also like a very, that essay is also an essay that's a lot about race, which is a big part of this book too because it was also a very awkward and weird time for me because I came to realize that in the deep South, they considered me white. Um, mm. And that was the first time I really became aware of like colorism and, and like light skin privilege and what that means. And like, you know, what it meant for people to just like meet me and like to think, oh, you're Italian. And I'm like, no, no, I'm Iranian. And then just being like, nope, you're a white person, you're Italian, which became my identity among the Faulkner world there, which is weird, they called me Pia. It was nuts. And so that was also like an interesting thing for me too. I think there's a lot of um, people in the Middle East really uh, get obsessed with Southern literature, I've, I've learned. And a lot of it's because of history of the Middle East and history of the American South, there's interesting parallels. I mean, you have this like fall of aristocracy and all this like darkness with like, you know, a lot of um, troubled history. And of course, there's something that I just barely touch on in the book, but it's, it's there, is that like, there's also a history of slavery in Iran, in fact. And I talk a little bit about Afro-Iranian lineage, too, and the fact that the whole south coast of Iran is black, and yet we don't even talk about that. Um, and knowing that so my family is connected to that. So that's a whole thing, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that essay to me is really special, um, because it's just a very weird one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's, I, I think it's one of my favorite essays. So there's so much, I, I just want to talk on and on and on about this. Um, cause there's so much 
going on in this book. And I'm just, I'm thinking about color itself, you know, the color brown, it comes across as this very basic color, right? But brown itself is every color mashed yeah. into one color. Um, and then that's sort of how I feel about this essay collection. There's so much in here. It's so deeply considered and it doesn't claim to have any answers. It's, um, it's comfortable with its discomfort. Oh, that's great. I hope that, that was a big goal I had for you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's also, it's deeply considered, but as they say in England, it's very Moorish. Like you just want more and more. You just want to keep consuming it. It's okay. very readable. Well, I had a really good editor too. And I gotta say, I was sick for like some of the curatorial duties of this book. And my editor really, I gotta say, like, I'm so happy that the Knopf Doubleday group bought this book and my next book. And I just had this amazing editor, Maria Goldberg, and she really helped me figure this out. Because I, for years, like since 2009, um, there was this idea that I do an essay collection, actually because of an editor at Knopf who brought that up. And I just had no idea how to put together an essay collection, you know? Mm -hmm. I, fiction is really my true love and even writing a memoir before this was weird but like I didn't really know how to put this together and she really helped me with that so great and what's the next book are you working on it is this the Tarangelis well book? yeah I'm supposed to be working on it but I'm doing a really bad job during lockdown wow. um but <laughs> I'm baking and reading about the basketball um yeah it's Tarangelis I think it's that Tarangelis book it's gonna probably be my best book in my head and that's a lot of pressure it's like the book that interests me the most, but it's like, it's like a fun satiric book, but it's also like a really difficult book. Cause there's like a, a language I invent for the cats. Like, and then there's like Valley Girl stream of consciousness. There's like a Molly Bloom chapter, but it's like in Valley Girl. And like, it's very difficult to write. There's like invented languages in it. And then it's also based on little women. It's like a very, very, very hard book to write. So it's like, I'm just putting it off just because I'm excited by it, but I'm like, I don't, I don't even know if I can, it's like too good for me somehow, but I want to do it. I got to just get back to it. I'm, I'm, I think a lot of, are you struggling with writing right now? It's kind of hard now. I have not been writing. I run a home, I run an elementary school. I don't know if you know about this, but that. yeah, well, I have two kids at home, so. You're having so many things that you're doing, right? Okay. Wow. Yeah. No, I'm not really running an elementary hey, school. No, I got it, I got it, yeah, yeah. But you've got your whole, yeah, so all the people that have kids right now, I don't even know no, what that Are anything. you homeschooling them all the time? Um, we, I wouldn't say all the time. I would say we, we get a good <laughs> hour or two in a day of, of something. Um, but yeah, no, I think that there's a certain, I don't know, I think because I have all these other obligations, I kind of fantasize about having the, uh, the, the time to write. And of course I could just block off an hour or two every day and get some writing done. I could, but I think it's more about sort of mental um, crowding yeah. that, that people are dealing with at this point. Yeah. It's like a stressful time. And for someone to be like, well, this is great writing residency for me during the pandemic. Like it's mm -hmm. kind of weird to be able to be that person who can just do that. I, I don't really feel that. So I just feel really stressed out. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm going to try every week. I'm like, this is the week I'm going to start working on my novel. But mm -hmm. fiction is so much harder for me to write than nonfiction. I, mm -hmm. Maybe you feel, do you feel this way? Like, fiction um, is I've always found fiction easier. But, you know, really? Yeah. Oh, fiction drives me nuts only because I love fiction so much. And like yeah. sentences and language are so important to me. I think I stress myself out about it too much mm -hmm. and nonfiction. i'm just like blah i'm just talking i'm just doing a service it's like social justice it's like twitter for me right mm -hmm. i'm just like blurting it out like i don't know i think it's also because i was a journalist i just got used to the idea that like the nonfiction, like your writing doesn't always have to be good like you right. just have to like get ideas across <laughs> and communicate well you know Absolutely. I, my like with my fiction i'm so like obsessed with the art but like you i, I just want to congratulate you too because you've got your TV thing which is amazing and then like you've got this whole like is it a middle grade book the Samosa I'm obsessed with that name Samosa Rebellion I like love it so much it's so cute I just I really want to write for children but I don't even know how to do it you know the reason I went to the middle grade book was because yeah. I was trying to write this big piece of adult fiction and it was like this big idea in my head yeah. and I was like writing the idea and I wasn't writing the story 
And I realized I'd kind of forgotten how to just write a simple story with characters who say things and do things. And so I went to this children's book idea, which had to stay very simple because kids, they just want a good story, right? Right, right, right. So that kind of, I had to like retrain myself to get back to simplicity. I love it. I I really want to do it. I actually want to write something for like K through like fifth grade. I like want a picture book. I really like those books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can, I don't think I am smart enough to do like middle grade, but I think I can do like a picture book. (laughs) I don't know why agent's like a big picture book, like, like, like writer. He's actually doing Uh really well. He says there's a lot of money in that. So I'm like, Uh fuck, I need to like start doing something that makes money for once. Yeah, I know. (laughs) No, I'm so devoted to the, to the hobo arts. Well, you do, you do a wonderful service to the world of the arts. Um, I think, let's see, we're getting close to eight. I think it's time to maybe open this up for audience questions. I think there's some things creeping around. Yeah. Evan, are you there? Do you want to? Sure, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thank you first both for for this lovely conversation. Um, We do have a few questions. I think they're still coming in. And um, if you're you're tuning in now and and you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, The first first question is, uh, is an easy one. Uh, it comes from Adrian. Uh, he's wondering if, if you have any opinions, Prochista, uh, on Michel Foucault's views about the Iranian Revolution. Oh my God, I love that book. That, that um, <laughs> well, it, it, it's a compilation of the writing that Foucault did. I think he did um, for Corriere de la Serra and for a French publication too. It was so crazy. They basically sent Foucault on assignment to cover the revolution in Iran. And it's like, a brilliant idea, right? To have this sort of like genius philosopher, like, okay, like how is he gonna deal with the revolution? And then he just writes all this bullshit, basically. So my answer is I absolutely hate the work he did around the Iranian revolution, because he was like such a bro about it. Like he basically was like, ooh, the spirit of revolution, these poor, dark, Middle Eastern people, they're so ignorant, but beautiful and passionate. Like I just found it to be so Orientalist and so crappy. And like, it's just a very lazy writing, but of course I'm thrilled by the idea of Foucault in Iran during this era, right? So like, I have like, I like joke about it a lot. I'm, I'm so glad it came up because people don't really know about this, this set of writing that Foucault did. Um, but I, I'm obsessed with it. And I think it's really entertaining, but it's like quite shitty actually. <laughs> um, it's a great idea that went really wrong. And it shows that like, you know, brilliant intellectuals and academic thinkers are not always the right people to just like send out to just cover like any major like world affair you know he really didn't know much about iran at all at all and and he tried but it's really just like very simplistic and the fact that he like many thought the iranian revolution was going to be this glorious thing um is you know it's kind of telling i mean it was a great it, there was like great ideas behind it but of course it was a disaster for iran in so many ways not that iran under the shah was necessarily great either but like certainly this was not the answer right what what has now happened to iran so yeah, I have a lot I can say on that. I can go on about that for years. Thank you for asking that. Thank you, and thank you for that for that answer. Um, I, I actually didn't know about the book either, so I'm I'm glad to. Exactly. But well, they compiled it. Some academic press, I think, did. If, if you know, put it in the comments. Yeah, I just I just dropped the link in there now. So. Oh great! It's a yeah, fascinating book. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in it, even even uh, if it didn't turn out as well as uh, as one might <laughs> yeah. have hoped. The train um, wreck. So. So the train wrecks are sometimes fun to watch, I guess. Uh, um, so the next question comes from Grace. Um, she is wondering, um, she says, uh, you, you say you don't want to be a spokesperson for Iran and Iranian identity, but what do you do when you see how ignorant people are about that part of the world? Yeah, that's, you know, it's a great question, Grace. I mean, the thing is, like, that's why I continue to write sometimes the same essay over and over again. I think that's why so many... Um, marginalized people end up having to just be a spokesman even though they don't want to be because I just think Americans are less curious than they act like. Like the American imagination is so limited in so many ways. If you think about people in the rest of the world, they learn so much about the rest of the world. They learn so much about America. They learn so much about, you know, everything. But Americans seem to be so interested in just America. And this is a real problem. So I feel like as long as I'm American, or certainly as long as I live here, I have to keep educating Americans because they don't seem to learn. I mean, it's unbelievable to me how often I have to ask, answer the very simple question, what's the difference between 
Iranian and Persian. And that's the first essay of this collection addresses that. <laughs> and it was in my old essay in the New York Times. But I've been, I've written about that issue so many times, you know, and, and still Americans can't understand it, you know, um, or like so many things. It, it's just, they don't, I think our education system is really partially at fault. But part of it is just like American self-absorbed, like, you know, Americans are very self-absorbed and that's the problem. And, and to get them interested in the rest of the world is a really, is a losing battle. Cause I think part of it is that they believe that the whole world is here, right? And there's truth to that, right? Like everyone in some way or another is a hyphenated American, perhaps other than like the real Americans, which are the native Americans. But this is a real, American identity is just a very weird concept and I, I just think you just have to constantly educate when you're here and it's really burdensome, but I just felt like that's part of my service. Like if I've been given a platform, like I certainly like have to do that now with my time too. Like that's my way of giving back. And so luckily I'm interested in being an educator. I, I love to teach. And so it's just part of something that's part of my life. So I, I just do it. But sometimes I am like, oh, Jesus Christ. I, I've <laughs> done this so many times. Like, I just think some of it also is willful. Like, I definitely know a racist when I see one because I just know they're asking a question, but they're not really asking it. Like, they they just want you to, like, jump through that hoop for them, and they're not really curious. They just they just love being ignorant because it, it, it's, a, it's a way of being superior, you know? Like, we don't have to know about the rest of your world, you poor brown people, you know? So, yep, yeah, it's a whole mess, but, yeah. I know, I know it wasn't, uh, it wasn't maybe the number one thing that you wanted to uh, address so much, but uh, like you said, yeah. it, it is a service and it is, it is one that's, that's much needed. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy. I'm happy to have that platform for sure. Like, yeah. Well, um, this next question uh, it dovetails on that a little bit. This uh, 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 comes from, um, um, from, from Yui. Forgive me if I've mispronounced your name. Um, she, she, they're, they're wondering, um, uh, thank you, first of all, for this event, which I found really inspirational. How would someone who's never been into writing start that journey? Um, would you have any wow. advice? Um, I you know the thing I usually tell people when they ask this, like, I actually do really like this question. It's like a very pure question. <laughs> and, and, and for me, it's like, I finally think I have the answer. And I think the answer really is just more about reading than writing. Um, I wonder, like, if Shanti, like, you feel the same way, too, but if someone's, like, wondering about how to get into writing or, like, how to start that journey, I would just say, like, figure out the books you love. Like, just start reading as much as you can and start to, like, compile, like, like have a stack of books at your writing desk that's, like, writers that you feel like are in your, like, in your sphere and your clan. They're your people. Those are the writers you love and those are the writers you want to sound like. Like, you don't think you will, but like you want to. Like for me, um, when I was like in my early 20s, one writer that was like that was like Zadie Smith. I really felt like me and Zadie Smith were like in dialogue somehow, <laughs> even though I, she was more accomplished by a lot. But I just felt like I wanted to like write about immigrants the way Zadie Smith wrote about her neighborhood in like London, you know? And um, so that was like one or like, you know, I don't know. I, I just like, I, I think that reading is really the key to being a good writer, much more than writing. I, of course, you should have a good writing practice, but I, I never talk about that that much because I'm really bad at that. And I'm very undisciplined and I don't write every day. So, um, I, I, but I do read every day and I think reading is really, really important. And that's what got me to want to, you know, to be a writer because I got so obsessed with, with the books I loved. I mean, I was such a, like, constant reader so that's what i would say what about you what do you think shanti about that? now i like this idea of looking for inspiration from other writers like established writers and i think that there's when you first start writing there's a certain amount of um i guess mimicry or copying other people's styles and you just have to accept that yeah um, because when you first start you don't really have your your own voice formed yet and if there are other voices that you love then that's a time to help those other voices form your own voice. Yeah. Um, and also it's a good way to understand what other writers are doing technically. You know, the way that a, uh, an artist will go to a museum and replicate something, you know, hanging in a museum just to sort of learn a technique or learn what was actually done. So yeah. I, like, I like that idea of, of using yeah. other 
writers. I, if you remember, we had a teacher actually at Johns Hopkins, and I thought this was a really good exercise um, where she would actually have me, would have you like type a, like a story you'd read, like you read a Flannery O'Connor story, and then she'd just have you like literally type the same story out. Hmm. Like that was just an exercise. It was, I think it was Jean would have us do that. Oh yeah. And, it's like kind of a, like we thought, oh, it's kind of like busy work. Why the fuck are we just typing out a story? But it kind of forced you to like pretend you were that writer, like getting into their mindset and like, and you'd like sort of notice their quirks with like syntax and diction. It's like kind of an interesting thing to mm -hmm. do. I should just do that right now because I don't feel like writing my own work, but like maybe that would inspire me. Yeah. I, don't know. I did that with um, Toni Morrison with Beloved. Wow. When I was trying to figure out how to work with non-chronology in one of my books, I would like find her little passages and just hand write oh. them out. Yeah, it was that's really real, you know, gives you time to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a really interesting exercise, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then so, I read a lot of poetry. I think poetry is really good. The poetry. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had another question um, from uh, uh, from Sharon, who is wondering about the other end of that process maybe, which is um, uh, how did you meet your editor and establish that relationship? Well, yeah, cause I was just talking about my editor that I love, Maria Goldberg. Well, see, I'm in the weird situation where like every book I've had has had a different editor. So I, this is my fourth book and every book has been in a different publishing house. So the next two books will be the same house and I hope to just stay there forever. But like, you know, all, every book has had a different experience. Like my first book was Grove Atlantic. I had an amazing editor, Amy Hunley, it was wonderful. And then my second book, I had some problems with my editors because they were having some life stuff and that the publishing house was a little bit messy. And then there was, um, my third book was like a great editor, but then she left and there was several other editors at HarperCollins. But then HarperCollins was a little bit of a weird place to be because it's like Rupert Murdoch owned and it was like not the right like place for me actually. It's the, the burdens of that place basically. So like, you know, now I'm at Penguin Random House at like with Knopf and I really like them. And then, then I just feel like the editor that I got paired with was the right one. And it was basically because my agent was sending out my book to different people. We just started sending this essay collection out and we really weren't feeling desperate about it. It was just something we were doing while other things were happening. And at first, like some editors were like, huh, maybe. Like, no one was like definitely biting with it. And then I read Samantha Irby who is an essayist I absolutely love. And she's like one of the greatest essayists at this time. And she had just come out with her like, her first big bestseller at that point, it was 2017. And I was like, huh, who's publishing Samantha Irby? And I was like, huh, she's at Vintage, the paperback imprint of Knopf, how weird. What a weird place to do Samantha Irby. Cause I always thought of Knopf in my head as like being kind of conservative and, and like, you know, very elegant, but serious. And I didn't think they'd do this like humor book that was really off the charts. And, and so, and then I was like, we gotta find out who Samantha Irby's editor is. I wrote my, my agent that, and he said, huh, it's this, it's this young woman named um, Maria Goldberg. She's like a younger editor, she's really smart, but I don't know too much about her. And I was like, just try her, why not? Even though my work is very different than Sam's, but I love Sam, now we know each other and everything. Um, and I just thought like, this is an editor that's like clearly like a very interesting thinker. And then I realized she actually edited my friend Greg Pardlow too. So she, and she, she was an editor for two black writers I really loved and who do really interesting work. And I was like, huh. So I was just sort of watching. And I think it's a good idea for writers to just watch editors and published writers they like. So we sent her the work and she just really liked it. She really got it. And it turned out that she had been keeping up with my work for a long time. And she already knew my other books. And so she basically got all my stuff. Sonny Mehta, you know, rest in peace, such an icon. He was still at Knopf. And the way they work is kind of like everyone has to agree to like take your book at Knopf. So he read like basically everything I read, like wrote rather. And Sonny Mehta was just like in an office reading all my books, including Sick, my memoir that hadn't come out yet. And he just got really into it, all my stuff. It was really cool. And they, they were like, yeah, we're going to take you. So it was kind of a really nice sort of um, um, narrative there. Um, but it's like, you know, you just really need a good agent who hears you and takes you to places that, you know, you want to be. And I think, like, I also had several agents. I had, I had three agents until I got to my current agent. And he's mm -hmm. younger than me. And when I first signed on with him, he was, like, very much a junior. He was, like, an assistant, actually, at Sterling World Literistic. And now he's a hotshot agent at, like, at the Gernert Company, who's, like, represents major best-selling authors. 
but he was very young then and he was very new and I just really liked him because he really understood my second novel which was a very weird book and he stuck by that book for two and a half years it was not selling whereas my first book like sold within a few weeks my second book took two and a half years and he stuck by me the whole time so he's been a great agent for me mm. so and he's the whole reason I've gotten to the right people that's wonderful. And um, so, um, I'm sorry to ask if you if you mentioned this earlier, but I know you said there's two books. Um, so so the first one is Brown Album, and then you're working yeah. on, on the next one. Is that? That's um, a novel. Okay, novel. perfect. Could, yeah. Awesome. And and um, we, we had a question from Ewan who's wondering if you are writing more essays and, and uh, if there there's a theme to them or... or um, how, are you writing basketball essays yet? What? Uh... <laughs> I really want to write basketball essays. You know, I've only written one sports essay and actually got like an award citation. Jonathan Franzen put it in like Best American Notable. And it was like, it was for um, Prairie Schooner, like an, a sports issue that Natalie Diaz edited years ago. So I would like to write more sports stuff. It was a tennis essay, actually. Um, but I'd love to write about basketball, actually. If I could be like more like into basketball properly, I need to learn it even more. Um, I, but I love sports writing, weirdly. I'm very into sports writing. Um, uh, I am writing more essays, even though I wrote these last two essays in this collection, pretending like I would never write an essay again. I really didn't want to write an essay again. I wanted this to be my last essay collection and for it to be done. But even during this pandemic, if you'll believe this, I'm currently working on four essays. <laughs> so I'm a fucking joke. That's what that should tell you. Like, I'm like an idiot. I don't know why I can't not I can't divorce myself well part of it is essays pay you know and like my short stories and certain novels like it takes longer and they don't pay like the essays do I just seem more in demand for essays I think as much as I I like like my other stuff more than my essays I think people like my essays the best so I'm just always writing essays and like even when I don't mean to write essays like I have this newsletter substack right and like I end up writing essays on that. You know, they just turn into essays. This weekend, I just wanted to write a little quick thing. I, I ended up writing a 2,000 word essay about being a person in their 40s who's kind of immature. Um, and so I just, I'm writing essays all the time, weirdly. And, and I didn't think I'd at all want to write about a pandemic, but it's finding my way into these other essays. Like I wrote an essay about climate change, it's in there. And it's like, it's in a lot of things I'm writing currently. Um, I even wrote a book review for Book Forum recently that's like the, the pandemic found its way into that essay, even though the, the, it's about a biography about Frida Kahlo. But like, you know, I was writing it when I was in Paris in early March, right before the lockdown. And I was kind of like retracing Frida Kahlo's steps. It's about Frida Kahlo in Paris. And uh, it was weird. Like the pandemic was in that piece too. So yeah, yeah, I'm still writing essays. <laughs> uh, where where can we read the one about uh, about being in your forties and? Uh... Um, it's on my Substack. If you want to sign up for my Substack, it's like a little like newsletter thing. Um, it's free. You can subscribe for free, and it's just like porchista.substack.com. I think I don't know. It's 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 you can find it really easily. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of you know. I try to write a few pieces a week on that. And uh, yeah, like there's a lot of stuff on there. Like I, you know, I want to write about Kobe Bryant stuff and I, I ended up writing a really long essay there. It was like really widely circulated, but it's kind of like my blog. Um, and I thought I would just be writing about certain topics like illness and Iranian stuff, but it's all over the place. I wrote an essay on baking. And, <laughs> yeah. It's all over the place. Awesome. I look forward I to checking that out. My a parasite cleansing. Oh my God. I wrote the most disgusting essay in, on that substack about like having worms in my poop. Didn't think you'd hear that sentence. And I did. <laughs> so. Always full of surprises. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh. Oh, I miss living with you. <laughs> I know. It's a real adventure, isn't it? <laughs> so fucking gross. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So the, the Substack link has just been dropped uh, here in the chat. Thank, thank you, Beth, for doing that. Um, I, I think that's, I think I, we, we got through all the questions. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I've got one more from, from Fiona. Can, can, can we take one more? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, Fiona says, I love listening to you and Miriam Gerba talk about uh, Karen's a few nights ago and the moment that they're having right now. Do you want to share any thoughts on the epic Karen meltdown that happened in Central Park? Of course I do. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what we're talking about, but in case you don't, 
um, today in Central Park, early in the morning, um, a woman that we should really call Karen, but her name was Amy Cooper, that on her Twitter quickly found out who she was, a white woman, um, probably around my age. She was uh, videotaped basically yelling at a black man who was there birding. He was a birder of all people. And he was just innocently birding in the morning at Central Park in a really pretty section, the Bramble. And apparently this woman like had her dog off leash. And I used to walk into Central Park all the time. And you know, a lot of Central Park is not off leash. There's only one little part that you could have your dogs off leash at certain hours, but certainly not in the Bramble. And so anyways, she had her dog off leash and this very polite birding black man, you can hear him on the thing, just basically saying like, asking her to put her dog on leash and she doesn't want to. She is being very confrontational and then she's saying, you need to stop videotaping me. He, he's very smartly has his phone out because she's freaking out in the middle of the park and like yelling at this like black man. And like, we know how that's gone in America recently, right? And so he's just like being very calm and polite and she's freaking out. And then she's like, you know what? I'm going to call the police on you. And I'm going to say an African man, African American man is threatening my life, which we can all see he's absolutely not. And he's like, go ahead, do that. And she literally gets on the phone with the police and she's like, there's an African-American man threatening me. And we watch her basically go from being very confrontational rude to pretending to cry. She's like freaking out, like totally putting on a show. I mean, I can't, I don't think we should even call her Karen. I mean, Karen's seem kind of like, they're bad, but they're like less harmful. This is like a true criminal. I mean, and also you can see her, not only is she committing a crime by falsely accusing this man of like threatening her, but also she can see her kind of choking her own dog it's really weird how she, she messes with her dog. It's like very disturbing actually. So she's also like, there's an animal abuse section there too, but it's also, it's of course weird because all these people on, on social media are like more upset about the dog. Like you're like, no, 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 this guy could have gotten killed. Cause of course people don't realize like, yeah, like first of all, Central Park, you should even be thinking of the Central Park Five. And the fact that like NYPD, like they could easily have killed this man. You know, there's a white lady freaking out saying this man is threatening her life, which, I mean, this guy could have easily died today. And, you know, thank God this made its way on social media. And, like, we all knew right where we fell on this. And I tweeted about it. And it was, like, you know, widely tweeted about. And they ID'd her. And she's, like, I don't know, a VP at some investment firm or something like that. And she's whatever. But, like, you know, this is, like, an important discussion to have right now, right? Because it's Ahmed Aubrey. Like, that just happened, right, a few months ago. And all these people are here, like, talking about justice for Ahmed, but, like, this woman probably felt that way, right? And now she's suddenly, like, accusing a black man who's, like, birding in the park of threatening her life because she herself is doing something wrong. I mean, I'm a dog owner. You know you have to have your dog on a leash. Dogs attack people. It's a thing that actually happens, you know? And, like, people don't like off-leash dogs. Like, that's just how it is. I never have my dog off-leash. But this Karen was entitled to, like, you know, felt, felt she was entitled. So, but she's a lot worse than a Karen. I mean, she's an absolute criminal. And I, I think people are like, oh, no, she's being doxxed. But I'm like, whatever. She literally could have caused this man to die. Like, I, I, I don't think we can go easy on racism at all. Like, we have to be very, very harsh on it. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what's going on. So I'm glad, glad Fiona brought that up because I'm very upset about that. And that's really, like been weighing on me heavily today because it's like you know I'm a New Yorker and I used to live very I used to live just a few blocks from Central Park and walk, I'd walk with my dog there every day so I really could feel what happened there and um it's just very sad and I hope that guy is okay today and um I wish we could check in on him more than like you know all the uh, other discussion we're having yeah mm -hmm. um is that it for questions, Evan? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, great. Yeah, Porchista, I, I thank you for your thoughts on that. I think a lot of us are, are thinking about that incident today. It's wild, right? Yeah. And it's like people think New York is not racist or something. Like New York is like the exception to the country, but it's like, no, it's actually some of the worst things that have happened to me in this country with racism that happened in New York and LA, actually, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well. Thank you for your frankness, your, you. your thoughts today. Thank you for writing this wonderful book, The Brown Album. I really loved it. I'll probably read it again very soon. Um, Thank you for doing this with me. I love you absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Yeah, it was fun. 
Um, and everyone, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. And yes. thank you all for joining us as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Porchista. It's delightful to see you as always. Thanks and so um, yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys in person. Yeah, hopefully we can all meet in person soon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Take care. I think I'm so proud of San Francisco and the Bay Area in general for doing so well with all this. Keep it up, guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm staying home. Yeah. yeah don't go to yeah. Okay. Um, well, take take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'll post the, the questions. Find me on social media, and I'll answer them. And and uh, I'll put the book link in the in the chat again. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, best of luck, Prochista, with the book. Thank and you. Good night, everyone. Good night, good night everyone. Bye. Bye.